people and machines working together to create artifacts that hadn't existed before. So it's completely new. And uh, Tim, we use the term social machines, uh, a term that Tim coined in his book, Weaving the Web, he wrote in 1999, which seems an age ago now, but that was only, you know, he still remember some of what he'd been, he'd been doing. And he says, um, real life must be full of all kinds of social constraints, the very processes from which society arises, that first sentence there. And what he's saying there is that We've learned to live in, in a so-called civilised society. We impose constraints upon ourselves in order to live in that society. I mean, generally speaking, I'm going to walk down that street and not get mugged or killed or someone's going to try and steal the money uh, but from me. But, of course, that happens and we, we have systems to deal with that. Um, and that's taken many millennia certainly centuries to evolve. And what he's really saying is that we'll get all this sort of behavior on the internet as well. And this is what the sociologists will say. I mean, there's the big controversy in sociology about what, what are the constants and what, how, how things change because of the environment. Um, but when you think about the way the digital world has unfolded, all the, the good and bad traits that we have as human beings in the physical world, you start to see happening in the digital world as well. People want to be nasty to you, they want to steal from you, and we have to try and stop that happening. We have to start, you know, try and keep a, a try and stop the pornography. We have to try and um, uh, deal with the bullying and intimidation. And a lot of that will be through education, education and literacy programs as much as, I mean, we don't impose curfews in towns like this in the physical world. We, we have systems to deal with something when the crime takes place, and, and we live with that. Um, so, you know, this whole discussion about how do you manage it in the digital world is all about the balance between control and freedoms. Uh, and we have to, and the pro we have to deal with that in the digital world just as we do in the physical world. <coughs> But it's all happening so much faster. And it's really hard uh, to, you know, things happen in the digital world before we've got, had the chance to even think through uh, the regulations of the basic technology, let alone when it gets more complicated. So that's that first sentence. Uh, we have students write whole essays about this topic. So then he says, Computers help if we can use them to create abstract social machines on the web, processes in which people do the creativity and the machine does the administration. This is the, the idea, as I said, it's the idea, I was I want to do this with my hands at this point. You've got the network of computers, the internet, uh, filtered through the web, that's the interface by which we access the computers and the information on them, and the net, a network of us, so it's not just one brain, it's the connections of brains of people who never met each other, and the people who are helping create this system, who've never met each other, generally, <coughs> are interacting with machines they know nothing about, and the machines know nothing about us. But together, these two sets of networks create the artifacts that we are now so familiar with, the web itself, uh, Google, Facebook, Twitter, Wikipedia, unbelievable, something quite a new phenomena. The trip advisors, the citizen science stuff like um, Zooniverse, where you get uh, people who know nothing about physics identifying galaxies. The disaster management system, like <coughs> the to help manage uh, the crisis after disaster, using things like OpenStreetMap. The Amazons, the Ebays, the YouTubes, <coughs> they're all examples of social machines. This is a new type of social machine, it's a new type of phenomenon. And that's why I'm so passionate about understanding it and learning about how they work, how they evolve, because to me that's the only way you're going to understand the future. Because people say to me, well the future must be about, it's all about cybersecurity. Well yes it may be, but actually the 
techies are going to come up with all sorts of ways to either help things be more secure or crack the codes. Right? That's what clever people do. But that will change behaviours. And uh, the whole idea of you know, our personal data, who has what rights to do what with it, uh, how long are people allowed to store it, public sector, private sector, all these issues, you've got the Know, the tech is developing the, as I say, the, the safe systems and the ways to crack those safe systems. But actually, it's the issue of how we behave around that, how it changes our behaviours, but how our behaviour contributes to the evolution of the technology. And I don't think you can think about the future without <coughs> thinking about these two types of systems working together to create these social machines. So this is most people, when they talk about big data, not just this line here. Just the, you know, you've got lots more computers, lots of processing power, we're able to generate and process and analyze lots of data. It's when you put people into the system, I think, you get the really interesting things, the hard, the really hard challenges. So you put people into the system, we get the social, we created these social networks, and the two things coming together are where the social machines sit. And that's the space that I'm really interested in studying. So we think of web science as the theory and practice of social machines. And actually, as a computer scientist, I think, oh, now, because people used to say to me, what's computer science? Actually, I started out as a pure mathematician, and lots of people say, well, what's pure mathematics? That's much harder to explain. That really does clear the kitchen at classes. You say you're doing a PhD in pure mathematics, people oh, really? As they walk away. But, well, that, I don't know if that happens in the Valley, but it certainly happens there in the UK. Um, computer science, I mean, that grew out of electronics. It was very interdisciplinary, and it's, uh, and it's quite hard to define what it is. What are you studying? Well, I now know it's the theory of the practice of the Turing machine. I found out what my discipline, original discipline is. And you get into all sorts of um, uh, questions, that, a whole other talk about, um, <coughs> you know, you've, uh, Turing had his ideas now a bit outdated, but very at the time he found about, you know, the Turing test to determine whether a machine had intelligence or not. Um, we could sort of apply those same sorts of ideas, but what would it mean to do that to social machines? Can a social machine have a conscience, for example? And can social machines think? Are they cognizant? Um, as we evolve, and as the Internet of Things starts piling in, I'm going to talk a bit more about that later, those are really, really interesting questions to ask ourselves. But I think in order to answer them, we have to work out new ways of studying them, because these have never, they haven't existed before. So we don't have methodologies for doing the research. And that's really what my last few years of work has been about, myself and others, of course. And we have uh, come up with this idea of the web observatory. And what do I mean by the web observatory? And this is, this is how we're going to forecast the future. So just stick with it for a little while, and uh, we'll get there. So, I came, we wrote this paper about it in, so that's two years ago now. Gosh, time flies. Seems like yesterday. And um, got the idea from, actually I got the idea when I was at Davos. You know the World Economic Forum at Davos? You might have heard of it. You walk up a mountain and all the world leaders are there. And it reminds me of a James Bond film because they all fly in helicopters. <laughs> and you're busting. <laughs> And it's all very, very secure. You have to go on the bus from the hotel. And anyway, it's quite exciting because once you get into this dome, this sort of tented dome up the top of an alp, uh, you're walking around because it's completely secure. Allegedly, nothing's ever been a problem there. You're walking around with the great and the good. You literally walk around. Well, I say, not the real high, high, you know, the current presidents are uh, usually. Off to one side. Anyway, it doesn't matter. I got this idea there about how 
because it seemed to me everybody I met at Davos was an amplifier. Right? And they had huge networks of people that they knew. And I thought, if I could just persuade a few of these people with a big idea, then that would be amplified around the world. So I thought, hmm, well, we could try that with uh, combining that with the idea of observatories. So got this idea from, well, the physicists have been doing this for a long time, uh, many centuries. Uh, and now it's a it's big business. They buy these amazing telescopes, train them on the skies, take these fantastic pictures, which is how they get their money, of course, because the politicians just love those pictures of the stars. And analyze, get tons of data, analyze it, and uh, they do it by sharing that information. Right? No one country, no one observatory can take in the whole, because of the way it works, you can't, uh, you can't cope with the, the whole uh, picture at the same time. So it's all about grabbing that data, and they've worked out mechanisms for sharing it so that we, we begin to understand where we came from and where we're going. Of course, <coughs> when they're observing the stars and the galaxies, they're not actually changing much about them. And this is a, you know, these, we're looking back at the Big Bang Theory, how we started, where we came from. This is many, many, many millennia ago. It all is a grand scale of time uh, that we are, you know, managing to see through these great telescopes. Something a little more, a little closer to trying to understand how the digital world evolves is climate science. Another very, this was a slide, I had one of my students did it for me, and I was a bit cluttered, but basically this is the idea that <clears throat> in order to understand the climate, you have to have a lot of data. And that data has to be gathered from all over the world. So the idea of uh, weather forecasting, you know, you've got centuries of data that's been collected by meteorologists, whether amateur or professional. Actually, I was looking at the weather forecast this morning, because I was wide awake at four o'clock this morning, of course, having just flown in from London. Turn on the television, there's a weather forecast for San Francisco where they have people t uh, tweeting in, I suppose it was tweeting, the temperature in their yard, as you call it. I call mine a garden, but you can call it a yard. Um, thinking, yeah, these are the amateur meteorologists telling channel whatever what the temperature is. This morning, that's a very accurate way of getting it. And um, uh, so basically this is a long-standing trend of meteorology, a lot of people love it. And our forecasts are getting better because, uh, maybe not in San Francisco, I gather the weather forecasting is still a bit of a magic, a bit of a uh, magic, because of climate change is so much like the UK really. But basically the forecasts are getting better because we have all this data going back centuries, very accurate data now, and we have much faster computers, much, um, we can develop better models, and we share information, we share information. And for climate science, you've got to not only know weather, you've got to know stuff about the oceans and the glaciers and the deserts and the, uh, you know, you've got pe teams of people working in, in different areas, and all that has data has to come together um, and be analyzed, um, in order to understand what impact we're having on what, what's happening to the climate and what impact we are having on it. Um, and we are, <coughs> we're observing physical things in this world. Some of it may well, the effect or the what's happening may be affected by our behaviors and what we're doing to the planet in terms of using up the resources and so on. But you're looking at physical objects now in the, in the web, if we try and do this in the web world, we're looking at digital objects and potentially by observing them we'll change them. But uh, that's another whole story. So the idea was to take this concept of amplification and observing and try and get people all around the world who are looking and trying to understand the web. There are researchers all over the world gathering data about uh, particular applications or behaviours, 
And that data just dissipates. Nobody, it doesn't get stored, it doesn't get shared. It's not available for reuse for people to repeat experiments. There's no ability to do longitudinal research. Now, of course, uh, in the Bay Area, I've got to say that a lot of this data is locked up in company, uh, in company data repositories of company, or to the big companies, the big social network companies. But that's going to be much harder. For that that's all in silos. They don't connect with each other with that fact. They don't share their data either. So that's a much harder issue to crack. A lot of the data is held by governments, and um, but there's huge amounts of data that researchers all around the world are collecting. So we're starting at that point, saying if we can share our data to look at how different cultures use the web, um, to study how this ecosystem is evolving, share the data, share the tools that we use to develop the data, then we might start to begin to, begin to build a picture of how this uh, <coughs> ecosystem works. So this is a picture my colleagues came up with about our software telescopes looking at this ecosystem called the web. There will be different levels of sharing. About 20% of the data in this type of world is open. Uh, there's a lot of shareable data. Um, you can share it under terms of conditions. There's a lot of data locked up. Um, it's probably the onions the wrong way around, I suppose. There's an awful lot of data that's either highly commercially confident or national security confidential. Um, but we've got to build that into our architectures. And then the idea is that we will have observatories all over the world, and people will be able to sh um, uh, comment. Not just uh, it's not it's not that we just want we want more people to be able to analyze the data. We want also the social scientists, the political scientists, the economists to be able to comment on the data. Um, so. This is actually a social machine to observe social machines uh, because we've got to persuade people to use it and it won't be useful to everybody's using it, so uh, uh, And actually, if you've read your Asimov, it's actually all stuff on history. Uh, if you haven't read your Asimov, read your Asimov Foundations and Empire. And um, did I spell cycle history right? My brain can't tell at the moment, but anyway. Um, we wanted to call websites psychohistory, but we didn't think anyone would know what we meant. And this is really the idea of you can't predict what an individual is going to do, but you can potentially predict or forecast what uh, people will do en masse. Right? The trends um, uh, of us acting as a herd, if you like. Uh, and that's what we're trying to capture here. So we have a web observatory at Southampton, it's got data stores, we put our the analytical tools in there where we can share them, we're very good at open source tools at Southampton, and then we have a portal for people looking at it. I don't want to go into the detail, if you want to have a look at the data that's in there, then uh, just look at webobservatory.sotten.ac.uk. Um, here's some examples of work we did with our Chinese colleagues analysing a salt crisis that they had. So we were, well I say we, um, the Chinese students were analysing the data in Weibo, in, the social, in that social network, about um, people telling jokes about when they ran out of salt in China after a Fukushima accident in Japan, because they, there was the belief that uh, salt protects you from nuclear radiation, and, uh, or anyway, the fallout from that. And they were looking at when people started telling jokes to know the crisis was over. That was the social scientists working with our data science students to produce different things. And we also look at the speed at which ideas are propagated. Uh, that's an, an example of Wikipedia versus Twitter. Um, so the idea is we link these observatories around, up around the world, and so we can do really do rich studies with them. Uh, how do we catalogue them? Well, we use a schema, uh, a very simple schema, so there's a metadata there around the data. So you really just say, I've got these data sets, and these are the terms and conditions that, with which you can use them, or just contact us or whatever. It's really a catalogue of a data set. 
and then if you look at the websites, Trust Site, you see the list of observatories. And we're starting to get them around the world. We installed one at Bangalore in February. We installed one in Adelaide uh, last month. And uh, they're beginning to pop up all over the world. Now, where are we going with this? Well, we're trying to map the digital universe, which is uh, a minor challenge. Sometimes you think, why, why am I beginning to do this? But I just really think it's important that we, that we, um, that we get the picture of what's going on all around the world, otherwise it doesn't make any sense to do this type of study. So why does this, where am I going in terms of what next for the, the web and the internet? What are we saying about the future? Well, I, really the, the, the point about the observatory is getting the evidence in order to, uh, just like the climate scientists, you're trying to say, here's the evidence as to why the world's getting hotter or colder or less this or more that. And what we're trying to do with websites is say, here's the evidence as to why you should bring in this policy and not that policy. Uh, things like net neutrality, uh, who runs the internet. Um, you know, when you ask the question about the future of the internet, you have to think about who owns it. Or doesn't you know what what happens? Uh, how how is it run? Um, you have to think about the issues of cyber security. What laws should we have? And if you bring that law in, what will the consequences of that be? What did people do when Egypt shut down the internet? When Egypt, you know, it's the first country to actually turn off turn off the internet. What's the implications of what's what's happening in Turkey or what's happening in Russia and China? Uh, what are the implications of what our government, I say US and the UK, I mean by our, but there's many other countries represented here, what our governments are doing, what the rules and regulations they're bringing in about when they can look at people's data and when they can't, as the, as the fallout from the Snowden affair. There's lots of people calling for a human rights charter for access for the internet and to have your privacy and security, um, what's the word I want? wants to say secured, but protected, privacy protected, security guaranteed. Uh, and all this is about, the work I've been talking about is getting the evidence and sharing uh, the data to, to create the evidence to help the politicians bring in the right policies and to provide businesses with the intelligence they need to grow and predict the markets they're going to have and how changes in technology might affect them. Uh, and this all leads to, as far as I'm concerned, an observatory approach to big data analytics for the web. Now, I want to say a couple more things. When did I start? I probably should be finishing about now, shouldn't I? I'm very close to the end, but there's a couple of big things to say. One is, we're about to have this happen. I think of that's like, do you know Monty Python? That uh, big foot coming down. <laughs> Monty Python. That's what I think. The Internet of Things is that big foot. And lots of people think, oh, right, it's this fluffy cloud of stuff and everything's going to talk to everything else. Well, I'm already losing stuff in the cloud. I don't know about you. I have stuff I thought was on my iPad and now it's in a cloud and I can't look at it when I'm on the airplane. And I think, how did that happen? Did anyone ask me about that? And I understand this stuff. Uh, that sort of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, so you're already losing stuff. And the one thing I'll say about the Internet of Things, which uh, causes people to stop and think, is it's not yet an Internet. The things talk to each other via the Internet, but they, they can't, they're all in silos. It's very proprietary, and it's a bit like the mobile phones were to start with. Uh, you know, you're into one particular manufacturer, uh, Samsung or Apple or whatever, and you, anything on the Internet can't talk to any other thing on the and also there's no rules about whether things have to talk to people before they make decisions. This is very Asimov as well. Right? We haven't worked out what's going to happen, but I think that's great because it gives us a bit of time to maybe get this right because otherwise the things really will take over the world and then that's like that big foot coming around. You see, we're all squashed. So people think of the internet as lots of little things. Actually, when they start working together, They'll feel like one bloody big oh, They'll feel like one big thing <laughs> that you have no control over. 
So it's a very interesting, uh, and of course there's lots of data wrapped up in there, and lots of personal data wrapped up in there as well. People will know where you are every second of the day. Um, I'll just point you to a project you may know about, W3C, the World Wide Web Consortium that Tim set up when he moved to MIT. I'll talk about the web of things, because I think we, the way we need to work with the Internet of Things is to abstract up to the data layer <coughs> and use the protocols we've got. And that's where you can do the stuff, the privacy and security and the trust, really important in this world. Um, so, uh, one other thing um, that I need to mention is that people are beginning to get very concerned about this wild west of the internet and, and how much it needs to be regulated and who owns it and who is allowed to do what with it. I'm on this. Um, I'm a commissioner on the Global Commission on Internet Governance, which has just produced this statement called Toward a Social Compact for Digital Privacy and Security. This is the balance between protection of personal data and security of the, of the, the nations, the citizens, from terrorists and criminals and so on. And we're talking about a multi-stakeholder multi approach. So it's a three-way thing between governments, businesses, and this is the individuals. Um, there's a lot of stuff in there, a lot of recommendations, which we are beginning to socialize. Um, I'm also on a review that's happening, that's GCHQ, by the way, in the UK. Uh, amazing. I love the design, because you think, oh, it's just something about the way it's designed. It says, it's like something science fiction -y. We're a, we're a hub and we can get all this data in. Amazing work they do there, but um, this is a, the, in, the UK Independent Surveillance Review. And we're going to report in July. Again, it's about to uh, recommend to the UK government what, uh, what, uh, how it should be think about managing um, personal data, what access it should think it needs to have to secure the state, and how you protect personal privacy within that. So there's a lot of, and I'm sh I know there's stuff going on in the US as well that I'm, I'm less familiar with. It's a really, really important topic at the moment. And my friend Manuel Castells, who's a famous social scientist, he said uh, this is really important because power relies on the control of communication. And digitization of everything implies digital surveillance can be comprehensive in an unprecedented way. We're sort of walking quiet, you know, eyes wide shut into 1984, because the technology enables that. So how are we, we going to deal with that? Because we all love this world, and we all know when we use uh, anything on the web that we're leaving those digital footprints, but we sort of, because it's, we get value out of it, we don't worry about it too much, but potentially we threaten our whole democracy, potentially. Um, so, um, I'm giving this talk the day after the 800th anniversary of the Magna Carta, which is when King John was forced to sign something. And there was a, this is the original Magna Carta from the British Library. It's in Latin and you can't read it. Either you can't read Latin or you can't read the script anyway. Uh, but it was 800 years ago today, yesterday, it was signed by King John. And there's lots of stuff in there. Uh, Women are very clearly goods and chattels in the Magna Carta, but that aside, um, it's got the great quote in there, contain, um, contains the first famous clause, to no one will we sell, to no one deny or delight, delay right or justice. It was really the first establishment of human rights. And there's a fantastic play on the BBC, I, on the BBC World Service at the moment called The Great Charter, in which they have the G20, this is set in 2025, so 10 years away, 10 years in the future. And they have the G20 and the I5, who are the five biggest internet companies, discussing a charter for the internet. And the internet starts, uh, while they're discussing it, it starts to be hacked and stop working. And it's a very interesting play, uh, well worth a listen, you can still get it on iPlayer. I think the radio I play is available outside the UK, I think, isn't it? 
the World Service one, I think it is. I listened to it just now without being on VPN, I think it is. The radio, not the television. It's really worth a listening, a listen to. It's really quite good. And um, so the future of the internet. My question is, is it going to, oh, I should have, I just wanted to mention the three things they talk about. These are the three things they, in this play, the playwright says, they are work, they, in the charter. An end to the weaponization of the internet, so we don't use it in wars. One network, one law. Hopefully that still means open protocols, at least the network there. And the right of access for all users. Those are the three things they came up with in the play. So, to me, the future of the internet is really in our hands. It could be an absolute nightmare. It, we could have developed the system that will take away all the freedom. And I don't just mean this in terms of surveillance. I just mean because, every, because our entire lives are there digitally and machines can do amazing stuff with that digital data. And we're just walking blindly, potentially, into something that will cause us all sorts of problems and take away all sorts of freedoms that we've spent many centuries building up. And uh, we've got, we could have the wars, internet wars, and the cyber crime, and all sorts of horrible things. Or, it could be for the good. It could be the utopia. It could be the thing that will help us with the freedoms and stop you know, the wars and uh, help us get knowledge to fight disease and fight pollution and provide, uh, help people get uh, food and water and it could be for the good. But actually my final point is, it's actually up to us to fight for that. Very sweeping all the way from the napkin diagram of the first internet and sort of Tim Berners Lee's generosity of giving things away for free and the sweeping arcs of how things evolved. And I think uh, the concept of social machines, I think the question like, can social machines think is like the coolest question I've heard in a long time. <laughs> um, we heard about the Web Observatory, this amazing endeavor by a worldwide network of um, researchers and individuals to catalog what is, how do machines interact with society. And of course, um, wrapping up with a huge amount of things that impact us all on all sorts of levels. Um, so we do have a few minutes for questions. Um, very happy to take them from the audience. If you uh, just uh, please speak up, since we don't have long cords for the mics. Thanks. Um, start with you, please. Yeah. Um, so you talked about. Uh, you briefly touched on the fact that social machines rely on data and systems that. Uh, are providing value to a different set of people than the people that are that are um, creating the data, uh, which is sort of a, a classic example of a collective action problem. Um, okay, you, you look. No, uh, well, uh, uh, it was so. Yes, I saw. I think I get what you're saying. Okay, the, the people yeah. receiving the value from yeah. social machines different from the people providing the the data and the services that create the social machines. Well, I don't think it's quite as clear cut as that. Okay. Uh, to be discussed, I mean, I, I think that, oh God, you've got a question at the end of that anyway. Yeah, <laughs> uh, so regardless of the exact distribution yeah. of those two things, assuming that there is a collective action problem inherent in social machines, yeah. um, how is that feasible on open platforms? Right? Do, you, do you not need closed platforms to be able to have systems that, that monetize well, that? It might help uh, to an example. I'm thinking what you're, what you're saying makes me think of the right to be forgotten. Um, now this is a big thing in Europe. I don't know how much it's hit in the US. The European courts gave people permission to have links removed to past events, like when they were charged, you know, found guilty of a crime. 
and, and they've done their time or whatever, or maybe they've won it on an appeal. So, and as I understand, and, and uh, so Google and the other social networks accepted this. So people can now ask Google to remove links to pages. As I understand it, the, that only removes the links to the European pages. It's still open in the US, or, and uh, and it's causing a lot of overhead. But I think this is sort of an example of what you're talking about because there's a whole big issue about whether we should be we should have the right to take things off the internet to delete stuff from the internet um, and whether it's a, there's a technology solution to that or a societal solution to that um, and and actually at the moment the only solution if the courts allow it and there's a lot of people say that this right to be forgotten is completely um, mad is complete madness because you know, it's, it, uh, there's stuff about you all over the internet. You're just taking away links. Is it going to remove it? And there's so many issues, moral and ethical issues about what should and shouldn't be removed, should, should and shouldn't be allowed to be removed. But at the moment, the people making the decision. So the European Parliament made the law, but the, but the, the people making the decision about what is accepted as yes, you can, that can be forgotten or remove those links are the companies or the technology companies are making that decision and on what basis we don't know uh, so I don't know if that was that's sort of a, an example that perhaps I can try to reframe <laughs> but uh, that wasn't then that's not what you're talking yeah. about really so that is a big issue by the way the one I've just raised but anyway go on the, say, say it again the reframe. semantic web has yeah. been I, I think uh, mm -hmm. many would consider it to be it hasn't lived up to the what, what people hoped it would be so far. Mm. Um, well, it has and it hasn't. I mean, it's beginning to now. Okay. But but um, its full potential hasn't been 